I want to start as a representative, if you will, of the administration by saying what today is not. Um, it's not, for us, about admissions. We believe we have very fair admissions processes. We believe we have transparent admissions processes. We believe we have the most outstanding collection of students, arguably, in North America. And we believe that sensitive and careful and thoughtful use of broad-based admissions can make that group even more diverse, even stronger as engaged learners, and even greater contributors to society. So it's not fundamentally at all about admissions. And secondly, the thing it's not, it's not for us about unhappiness over the way that students choose to associate or to be engaged. First of all, be incredibly presumptuous of me. Students are bright, they're experts about their own experience, they're quite capable of choosing how they spend their time, who they spend it with, and how they direct their passions and their energy. But it's also not a worry because as I look at it, and as we do surveys, people are doing a pretty good job of mixing the way they want and taking advantage of UBC and what it has to offer to both of its campuses. You know, it's funny, the article used the Chinese varsity club as an example. Actually, I think, unless I'm wrong, I, oh, here's the club expert right here. I think, in fact, the swing dance club is still probably the single largest club. 650 members? It's, it's the dance club. The dance club, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> swing went out when you were uh, young. <laughs> Still good. <laughs> These are the same panelists who are going to hear something about the dangers of staring. <laughs> Tuesday night, I spent 6.30 to 7.30 on the second floor near the Tommy Lee Music Shop taking West Coast Funk Swing Dance. <laughs> and I'm about as elegant as those equations on it. <laughs> um, but what I wanted to, to say is that uh, that's just an illustration of the way people choose and how they spend their time. In fact, the largest single impediment we know from U.S. students to your being able to associate when you want, with whom you want, and the depth you want is the length of your commute. So frankly, for us, the biggest single issue around that part of student life is finding ways to be even more supportive of commuting students and of supporting the choices they make. So what is it about them? It's number one about people. What does this mean, this episode, and all the ripples around it, all the stuff leading up, all the sequelae that will be? What does it mean to individuals who feels included and hurt? Who feels marginalized and hurt? And in addition to the obvious, to take another example, what about a student, one of your fellow students, who's taken a leave of absence, is an intern at a national publication, co-authors an article like this and is busily being demonized. I'm sure we'll hear some things from Candace and others about that, but there's a student who is also a colleague of yours hurting in the middle of this episode. Whatever you may think about whether it's deserved or not, there's some hurt. So it's fundamentally about people. And last point for me, it's also fundamentally about learning. That's why we're here. We're here to learn. Um, I am old-fashioned enough and old enough to remember teach-ins. Uh, not just Jerry Rubin at the faculty club, but a few other things. But it's about learning. Place and promise, don't leave home without it. Strategic plan of your university. But student learning and a transformative approach to it is key here. And it includes in the vision statement something about sustaining a civil and sustainable society and working all of us in an exceptional learning environment that promotes global citizenship. So that's what today is a fine expression of. I'm delighted to be joining with you. I will be listening as one of a number of administrative types, if you will, here. There are several of us listening closely, hearing the concerns, and working with you and pledging to formulate any further actions or discussions that make sense. Yes. Brian. Uh, thank you, panelists, uh, members of the UBC administration, staff, and UBC students. So as we begin this panel discussion on the impacts of stereotyping, journalistic ethics, um, race, and our campus community, uh, the Alma Matter Society at the University of British Columbia would like to thank all those who have worked extremely hard on bringing this together at such a short notice. 
The AMS is the Student Society here at UBC and represents all UBC students. We strive for equity and diverse representation in all our institutional structures and processes. We provide services to students, lobby on their behalf, and are currently involved in the construction of a new student union building. With the recent dialogue that has been sparked, we encourage all our student members to actively participate and to remain informed. To begin this panel discussion, both Brian and I will act as team moderators for the, the event. Um, we will be introducing each panelist and providing a brief bio. So we'll start with uh, Dr. Carrie Jang. Dr. Carrie Jang is a professor at the Department of Psych uh, Psychiatry in the Faculty of Medicine at UBC and a Vancouver City Councilor. Carrie is a frequent media commentator on city issues, bringing the voice of the community to city debates. With the assistance of the Tides Foundation, Carrie helped arrange a forum that brought together residents and agencies from across Vancouver to share their experiences and learn from each other on how to tackle major issues such as housing, homelessness, and addiction. Carrie spends much of his volunteer time with the newly established Mental Health Commission of Canada. With this organization, Carrie was appointed to the Mental Health and the Law Advisory Committee by Michael Kirby. This committee is tasked to help set national policy and standards on mental health and to provide a knowledge exchange and assist in the creation of an anti-stigma campaign. This year, the many departments that make up UBC's Faculty of Medicine have selected Carrie for a Community Service Award for his years of volunteer and board work that have made a real difference in people's lives. So thank you, Carrie. Um, our second panelist is Dr. Henry Yu. Dr. Henry Yu is a professor of history at the University of British Columbia. He's currently writing a book entitled Pacific Canada, which argues for a perspective on our society that recognizes the inequities of our past and rebuilds in a collaborative manner a new approach to our common history and future together. Henry was born in Vancouver and grew up in Vancouver and Vancouver Island. He received his BA in, honor, uh, in honors history from UBC and an MA and PhD in history from Princeton University. After teaching at UCLA for a decade, Henry returned to UBC as an associate professor of history to help build programs focused on trans specific Canada. Thank you, Henry. Our third uh, panelist is Dr. Candace Callison. Dr. Candace Callison is an assistant professor in, the Uni in UBC uh, Graduate School of Journalism. Candace received her PhD from the program in Science, Technology, and Society at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in 2010. Her professional background includes seven years of producing, writing, and reporting for television, the internet, and radio in Canada and both the United States. For her early work in media convergence, Candice was profiled in the book 2003 book, Technology with Purpose, Women Reshaping the Digital, Digital Landscape. Her independently produced 1995 film, uh, Traditional Renaissance, was included in the UBC Museum of Anthropology's 2003-2004 exhibit on Tatan culture, Mihadini, our great ancestors of Battle. From 2000 and 2002, Candice was selected by Nash the National uh, Aboriginal Achievement Foundation as the CN Aboriginal Scholar, and in 2004, she was a Martin Family Fellow for Sustainability. Her doctor doctoral research was supported in part by the National Science Foundation and the Center for the Study of Diversity in Science, Technology, and Medicine at MIT. She was born and raised in, in and around Vancouver and is a mem mem member of the Talton Nation located in Northwestern BC. Our fourth speaker is Elisa Hong. Elisa is in her last year of her undergraduate degree in political science. Her studies focus mainly on human security and transitional justice issues. Most recently, she attended the Wilton Park Atlantic Youth Forum this summer in London, England, a forum put on by the UK Foreign Commonwealth Office that works to bring together university students from around the world to engage in dialogue on common issues and concerns. Lisa is also a student staff member of the Terry Project, an initiative that promotes interdisciplinary learning and engagement with global advocacy issues. Thank you, Lisa. Our last speaker um, is Will Tao. Will is in his final year of his studies in history and international relations. His academic focus is on the study of the Chinese and Indian diaspora in Vancouver. Will is the former president of the Emerging Leaders of UBC, where he helped inspire over 175 students under the mantra, Leadership as a Service to Others. He has been actively involved in many sectors of campus, including UBC Rec, UBC Orientations, and the Greek system. He is looking forward to sharing with this panel his unique experiences as both a UBC student and as a Chinese and as a Chinese-born Canadian, who has grown over time to appreciate and cherish, cherish his ethnic and cultural background. So, can we get a big round of applause for all of us? Um, so, we'll begin with the. Each of the panelists have been given uh, a question, or about four questions, and they are the impact of 
stereotyping and profiling in society and in post-secondary settings in Canada, why certain groups are too often targeted by the media and portrayed through stereotypes, journalistic integrity and issues of media ethics and responsibility in detecting diversity issues, and lastly, should we continue to generate an open dialogue about race, and how can we do this respectively <coughs> and responsibly? Uh, and so with that, we're going to ask each of the panelists to briefly talk about their initial views on these questions, and uh, we'll start with Dr. Kerry. Well, thanks a lot for inviting me and being here. It's always good to be among students and all that. But uh, just because I'll start off by giving a little background about me, so you can tell I'm a Chinese guy. But uh, <laughs> granddad came over during the Qing Dynasty, so that's when the last emperor moved, if you don't know the time period. So he came on over, and uh, you know most of the guys were building the railway. My grandfather came over as a merchant. He said, you need your wife over? I'll bring him over for you, right? So that's, that was our family background. But for me... You know, apparently wasn't very good. I got run out of Victoria or something like this. Uh, but anyhow, um, what's important about this? So you know, we've, my my family's been here a long time, and uh, you know, my parents were born here. As a, both sides of my family were born here as well. I was born here. It was very interesting. We used to speak Chinese perfectly. Apparently, good to sound dialect. You know, we speak that kind of <laughs> language. A lot of Chinese kids that know my most kids are from the don't talk good. Um, and. Um, my mother, at five years of age, she switched us over to English completely because she wanted to make sure we didn't have an accent when we spoke English. Because in their day, it was tough. So you had to be as non-Chinese as possible. So I kind of grew up being kind of non-Chinese, but being reminded I was Chinese every so often. And you went back and forth at this kind of thing. So quite frankly, I didn't quite know how to react when I read the article. Because on the one hand, I said, well, I'm kind of pissed off. On the other hand, I said, well, maybe some of the stuff here is kind of right, because I'm not quite sure. And, uh, you know, like my grandparents paid the head tax, and so everybody was all trying to get the head tax money, for example, right? The Jang family, they said, well, you know, it was kind of worth it to get the heck out of China. It was kind of bad times. We paid double to get out of there. So they said, don't go for it. So what do you do? So this is sort of the re my family background and where my headspace was. And I read the article, and I couldn't quite know how I felt about it. And actually, I, I finally decided how I felt about it today, walking up the street. But I'll tell you about that in a sec. But in terms of the four questions, you know, a lot of the things raised in that article really kind of mirrored my feelings that happened when I entered politics two years ago when I ran for city council. You know, when, we, when I first thought about running, everybody said, we need a Chinese guy. We have to have a visible minority there. We've got to have you. We've got to have you. We've got to have you. The next thing you know, three of us get elected. <laughs> Do you think we're too many? <laughs> what about the women? What about the Aboriginal? What about the South Asians? I said, you don't blame me. You know, I mean, you know. So, you know. Race is one of those things that gets pushed back and forth on me, and I quite don't know what to do sometimes. And, you know, and it really came home just not very recently with, with the Fadden thing, when, when the head of CSIS talked about Chinese spies and municipal politicians being Chinese spies. Of course, he never named any of us, but by implication, this goes to the second question as well, I was fingered as one of these spies. And for the first time in my life, I got hate mail where people really hated me. It got to the point where we had to make sure the Vancouver police and all this were aware of the stuff that we were getting because it was that scary. You know, you're a dirty spy, we're going to get you and all that kind of stuff. So that's the impact. So, you know, that was you know, something that really came home to me. But really, you know, it's funny. We talk about journalistic integrity and media issues. Well, as a politician, everything I say, I get in trouble for anyways. Uh, what, what is very true is, and I do see this across the media, that it's very clear that media is looking for... Uh, a sensational headline to sell the papers. And this is particularly true now with the print media, it's because, quite frankly, they've lost their share. Their subscriptions are way down and all that kind of stuff. And so man, nobody gets their magazines online anymore. And to attract attention to your website to get those subscriptions, those numbers up through your advertising, is really tough. And the journalists tell me this themselves. And it's really unfortunate. You know, just the other day when we had the unfortunate hostage taking at the Ray County Community Center, our mayor, you know, he wrote a statement and he says, you know, we're worried about mental you know, this fellow had mental illness and all this, but they didn't publish the whole statement. And so, of course, everybody was criticizing the mayor for something. They said, well, you can't make, cast aspersions about people like that. And then we made the sun print the rest of it and said that, no, we're talking about mental health issues in particular. And what we can do as a society to make it better. And everybody, oh, okay, great. But you see, this happens all the time. You know, not one media cycle goes by in my life. You know, the, the worst thing as a politician, I'm a, I'm a prof, so I'm used to taking my time at things, right? But what happens is you get up in the morning, and the first thing you grab is not the cup of coffee. You know, you don't go run, you know, get washed and brush your teeth. You grab your Blackberry to see what the media summary is today, and whether or not you were misquoted. And it's absolutely frightening. 
and then you know you're picked on more is because you're a yellow guy. They say, well, uh, look at that guy today, you know, because you know the, the Chinese media they always come to you no matter what, right? You know, man, well, you don't want or not. I say, oh, I have things. They come to you. I said, I don't speak Chinese at all. That's okay. You speak English. <laughs> That's fine. We we'll translate for you. So I mean, it's, it, it goes back and forth, back and forth like this. But one thing I, I, I do want to add, and I'm going to only got five minutes. Uh, Let's start with, and, uh, you know, I, these questions are really good. I can talk about one, the, everything for about an hour a piece and do lectures on each one. But talking about open dialogue and, and, and about race and stuff like this, one thing I have learned at City Hall that's really interesting is that, on the one hand, we try to make sure everybody's included. And so we have so many committees, citizen advisory committees. And this is not a criticism, but rather it becomes, starts becoming unwieldy because you have to have a special committee for every special group. And it gets to the point where... After a while, it gets all mixed up, and you'll end up building silos, the very silos you're trying to break down in Canada. is by having trying to recognize each group. So everybody would say, I'm putting my gender lens on today, I'm putting my, my ethnicity lens on today as I'm looking at a city report. Even if it has nothing to do with it, you know, they put it on and they speak at length about it. And it comes to the point where you're trying to be too good, you kind of slow things up. But then it goes the other way as well. How many times have I been called an Asian? Right? Probably all the Asian, you've been called an Asian. I'm not Asian, I'm Chinese. Don't lump me in with the other guys, okay? You know, I used to say it all the time, but gee, I'm not like those Japanese guys. We fought with those guys. We don't lump them. You know, but that's the problem. See, that's the other extreme. You get called Asian. Well, well, no, I'm not Filipino. I'm Chinese. Call me that. I'm Southern Chinese. Heck, those Northerners. We're Southern Chinese. I'm from Plotana. Anyway. But you see, this is how it kind of goes. So, how did I feel about all this? I was really, really, you can tell I'm kind of mixed feelings about it. I didn't quite know how to react. Some people were absolutely upset. I spoke to Henry a little bit. He's one perspective. I spoke to fellows on city council, and some were upset, some weren't upset. And I said, how, do I, how does it really make me feel? And how does this impact the university and what we do here? And I think what the university should be, and this is why we're all here, is because it has to be a place of safety, a place where we can talk about race, ethnicity, gender issues, but in a safe environment. And that article, for the first time, didn't make me feel safe that I could talk about it here. They were turning our university, by saying those types of into something that was pitting one group against another. It could be Chinese today, Asians tomorrow, whatever you want to be, right? Women, men, you name it. Um, LGBTQ versus seniors, you know, we see this all the time. And so really, what I think we should be affirming here is not, you know, what you are, who you are. We all know who we are and what we are. And I look around here, I can tell who's Chinese and who's not, more or less. Um, but the important thing is, is that we have to make sure we have an environment in which it's safe to talk about things. You know, that whole notion of something called academic freedom. That we, we should be free enough to talk about it, and we should also make sure it's safe. And, and as a last thing, you know, back when I was doing my PhD at the University of Western Ontario, I was doing it with a guy named Phil Rushton. Remember Phil Rushton? Anybody remember Phil? Well, he had the data, he had the so-called data that was called, uh, where he said, you know, the penises of black men are larger than uh, white guys, and white guys are bigger than Chinese guys, and um, that counts for the differences in fecundity rates and all this, and then they were saying with brain size that the Asians were smarter because they had bigger brains and all this kind of stuff. It was absolute crock. What I would say is I defended his right to do that kind of research because, you know, that's a legitimate question. We should be able to ask anything. But I will question the sources, I will question the data, and I will take them to task. In fact, I, that's what I did. In fact, I showed with his own IQ data that the overlaps and the curves were so high, there was no functional difference between any group. Right? But that's what we have to do. We have to stick to the data. And I, I say this to the, the, the journalists all the time. Here's your data. Please show me the data. Please demonstrate why. You know, that's the only way we're going to feel safe. And, uh, and for us to be able to criticize that data and how it was collected. So that's all I'm going to say. You know, there'll be questions. I'm sure I can you know, expound more on, on bits and pieces of it. But like I said, at the end of the day, I still feel that UBC is a very is a safe university. It's a place where we can talk about this stuff. But articles like the McLean's ones makes me wonder if they're going to turn our universities into somewhere that we can't talk about these things and make us feel very uncomfortable doing it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thanks, all of you, for coming on a snowstorm. It's like I had difficulty getting here. Um, thanks also to Brian and, and Carrie and uh, all, all, all of you for actually approaching me with humor. I've, seen, I've heard a lot of laughter here. And I think that's actually one of the things I'd say right off the bat, is that 
responding to something like that article, I've, I've seen a lot of mocking. And maybe it's a generational thing that uh, younger people, you kind of feel angry and hurt and, and you, you kind of use black humor to shake it off. Um, i got to admit, when I read that article, uh, right away, the two Asians were thinking, that's an interesting question. What, what does that even mean? Right? It's like, Japanese restaurants are too Asian. Or, you know, like, <laughs> or, or what, what, is it, what does it mean to have something too Asian? You know? But as I read it, it was funny, because I, I, I really have to admit that part is going, oh, there's some interesting points in here, but it's buried in the lead. Usually journalists say, don't bury the lead which means don't take your most interesting thing and bury it in paragraph 15 so that no one gets there. You lead with, and what they were leading with, in some sense, was this idea, a strange idea, that a university, our university could be too Asian. And not only that, it's this strange sort of too Asian because Asians work too hard and get too great, their grades are too high, and then, and then they only hang out with each other. <laughs> I'm thinking, I, I teach at this place, and I have no idea what you're talking about in this article. So there's, first it was sort of this, I have no idea what this, this is about. Now, I'm a historian, so I'll tell you a little history. One is that the whole idea that Canada or the United States or many of the places in North America could be too Asian, that's a lo- there's a long history to that question. It came out of the idea that there was a yellow peril, and that Chinese at first, but then also Japanese and all people from Asia were going to be a threat now, it's funny, back 150 years ago, this is what I study, the threat was that Asians were cheap. And what that meant was they could do more with less. That's a threat. And so what you have is the creation of white supremacy around the idea that Asians are threatening to whites. Now, Asians, they all look alike. all oh, black hair, it's like Chinese, Japanese, I don't care. Right? <laughs> it's just, let's keep all of you up. That was basically the anti-Asian politics that helped build British Columbia, California, Oregon. It's a long time ago. That's why the other emotion I had when I read this was sadness. I was born in 1967, the centennial of Canada. I grew up in a place that had a lot of hope that this was a new country that was putting behind its past, where you'd be treated not by the color of your skin, but as Martin Luther King said, the content of your character. That you'd be judged not by a racial category, but who you are, how good you are at things. You know, I, I, was, I got good grades in high school, I hid that. Nobody knew I was on the honor roll, because I was the captain of the basketball team, because I was the student council president. Because I tried too hard, <coughs> I was too Asian. I worked really hard to make sure that I wasn't the guy who was the math geek. I hid my grades. <clears throat> when I wrote the LSAT to go to law school, people kept asking, what did you get on the LSAT? Mm. <laughs> they kept going, oh, you must have done crappy. The reason why is because I got 99 percentile. I'm thinking, damn, that's so Asian. <laughs> you know? Now, I tell you this, as a, again, it's, it's funny, because we face the legacies of a long history of white supremacy. I mean, people keep saying, Canada didn't have white supremacy. <laughs> yeah, we did. You know? People keep on thinking of apartheid, American South, you know, KKK. <laughs> we had a KKK here in Shaughnessy. I don't know if you know that. Housing covenants. They're still land titles. You buy a house in Shaughnessy or in British properties, there's still, it says, don't sell to Jews, natives or blacks, or Asians. Now, no one's enforcing that anymore because they're a new Canada. And a new Canada began actually the year that I was born when we changed the way our immigration policy. And that's, in some sense, what this article is about. Canada is a different place than it was in 1967. It's been 43 years. It's how old I am. We're in a different place. This article harkens back to an older Canada. One that, in fact, if you look at the blogs and the reactions from young people... There's, what, this is a pointless article for most people who are below a certain age. But it's also a hurtful article for a lot of people. And in fact, the irony is, if you've just arrived from Asia, to be said, well, if someone says, hey, you're so Asian, it's like, well, of course, I was born in Asia. That's not the person who's going to actually feel hurt the most. You know who's going to feel hurt the most? The person who tried really hard in elementary school and high school to fit in. 
the person who, like me, thought, I mean, if I'm the captain of the basketball team, it'll be okay. Maybe if I really work hard to fit in. But then every once in a while, someone calls you rice, like someone did on when I was playing football. I know I'm playing football, so all I did was like really hit him hard the next time he came on. <laughs> got a little bit of But it's the feeling of, what else do you want me to do? You say I don't fit in, I do everything to fit in, and then you say I don't fit in. And that's the hurt. And it's not just, in some sense, the hurt of Asian Canadians or Chinese or whatever. It's the hurt of a society that had been built around white supremacy, where the norm is to be Canadian. And you don't have to say white Canadian, because it's just a Molson Canadian ad. That's just the way it is. I look at a Molson Canadian ad and go, well, I drink. Where am I in that advertisement? Don't you want me to drink Molson Canadian? I guess not. So one of the things I'd say, and I'll quickly go on to the last couple of points, there's a lot of panelists here, is I've seen online an amazing amount of energy as people try to figure out and express just what it is that bothers them about this. Because it's not straightforward. It's not like, all Asians suck, go away. It's like, Asians are wonderful, you work so hard. It's like, is that a good thing? It's what it was said 110 years ago in anti-Asian rhetoric. Asians work too hard, so they must go. So that's one thing to remember. The other is, if they, McLean's going to say sorry. Uh, I have an op ed piece coming out in the sun probably in the next few days. So I'm just going to cave on this. The reason why is McLean's is one of their divisions. No one reads McLean's. It shows up in your, op- your doctor's office. You're forced to read it by with it. <laughs> and small town Canadians read it as their weekly digest. But that demographic is shrinking. They're not going to diversify their newsroom because they can't afford to diversify their newsroom. They're firing people, not hiring people. So one of the problems is this story came out. Anybody, anybody have a problem with this? Nope. Okay. You know why I don't have a problem with it? I don't know. No one had a problem with it because that newsroom is not a diverse place. And so they'll continue to produce stories where right now they're still saying, what's, what's everybody so angry about? I don't understand. Well, maybe it's because your newsroom isn't very diverse. And no one's in there saying, by the way, this is not a great idea. <laughs> so, one of the challenges is what to do, in some sense, to change, because we have new media, blog and all this kind of stuff, and then we have the old print media, which is shrinking. And so Rogers, you know, and this is actually not my idea, this came as a suggestion from a student, I'll end with this, Rogers is scared. It's, they're, they're, the wallet's being scared out of it, because they've got a bunch of communications divisions. The core demographic from McLean is, as I said, doctor's offices and small town Canada. Toronto, Vancouver, piss them off. But their cell phone division. If they lost their monopoly on iPhone, if a bunch of young Chinese and Korean and Japanese Canadians who are their core demographic in Vancouver and Toronto, who, if 5,000 of you were to say, I'm switching the bell, right? and the reason why I'm switching the bell is Rogers is so laughable, it's uncool, you know, they don't understand me, guess what's going to happen very quickly? They're going, to, okay, they're going to apologize. And it'll be an abject apology. 30 years ago, there was a W5 episode that made almost the same argument about it called Campus Giveaway. And so what will happen is, okay, but, uh, you know, if one thing I say as a historian, don't let them cave too quickly. Because in one sense, they make a lot of money from selling you cell phones, from Omni TV. They own Omni, the multicultural channel. One hand... They can hurt you. On the other hand, they're actually getting more viewership because all these covering Chinese Canadian reactions to this. But what if you were to say, "We'll hurt one of your divisions for the sins of another"? That's the way consumer choices and market segmentation works right now. And in order for you to get off the hook, don't just apologize. Create an endowment on how the new media can be more diverse and engage young voices people like UBC students. Make them pay from the profits they have made, not from McLean's. McLean's is dead. It's a dinosaur. It's, 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 it's as gone, in some sense, in its current form as anything that's from the old Canada. Make them pay for the creation of a new Canada, where your voice is important, where 
the fact that we live on the traditional unceded territory of the Coast Salish peoples right now is something that we, and often you see we say right away, because it's true, because we have a history of colonialism, because we have a history of white supremacy. Let's not avoid the issue. Let's say, how do we together work together and create a better society? And let's leave behind the sort of questions that are just old questions that don't lead us anywhere. That's like whether our universities are too Asian. Thank you. The, uh, the thanks for coming out uh, on this snow day, and also um, acknowledge that we're on the unceded territory of Muslim peoples. Um, I have a couple of uh, sets of comments. So one is about the article itself, and the other is about ethics and journalism. So let me start with the article. Um, first of all, uh, it's really interesting to hear it carries uh, mixed feelings when you first read it. Um, one of the things that uh, we talk about in uh, media studies and in journalism is this uh, notion of framing, right? So it's frames are these cognitive uh, shorthands that we use to understand something. So uh, this article set out with a, an absolute uh, way of framing the problem of diversity and admissions, right? It tackles those two problems in a very specific kind of way by, you know, starting with some party girls who refuse to be... Uh, identified, which, you know, usually you don't give anonymity to sources unless their life is in danger. Um, <laughs> perhaps their, their parents. Are in danger, but not much else, right? Not in any kind of physical danger. Um, so, uh, right away, that's, you know, one flag uh, as uh, somebody who reads uh, articles all the time and uh, people who teach journalism. That's, you know, the first flag. So sources, um, and, you know, the second flag is the framing, right? So starting with uh, identifying this problem as one of two Asian, as opposed to how do we deal with diversity? Do Canada's uh, universities reflect the uh, way that Canada's population breaks down? Do we have a good reflection of that? Um, and if you look at the article, really, if you lop off the first half and you just start reading in the middle, it sounds more like a discussion about diversity, right, for the last half of the article. We have some really great uh, quotes from our own president, President <coughs> um, A lot of the evidence that is marshaled, no doubt when they talk to those researchers, they weren't uh, talking about uh, Alexandra and Rachel, right? Those are the two girls' names. They're talking about, uh, you know, how do we deal with uh, students when they come onto campus? How do we deal with questions of diversity, right? So there's a, a real disconnect between the kinds of evidence that they're marshalling and the framing that they're using. So those are some, some things about the, the article. And the other thing that you need to keep in mind is that uh, McLean's is not the media, right? It's one publication. And it's a publication that, um, you know, if you were to do a, you know, Robert McChesney type or a Noam Chomsky type analysis of it, you might say it fits into the neoconservative uh, type style of, of journalism. And, uh, you know, that's an increasing issue um, as we look at the way that uh, the, the um, industry of media is beginning to change, and you look at media consolidation, particularly here in, in Canada. Um, and so media ownership is an issue. Uh, the editor of McLean's uh, was formerly uh, the editor of, uh, an editor at the no National Post. So it's coming from a certain uh, viewpoint. It's coming from a certain way of asking questions. And um, uh, Henry was right to point out that there's likely a lack of diversity in the newsroom. I don't know what the newsroom is at McLean's, but I do know we recently had um, a major editor from another major Canadian publication at the school, and uh, we asked him about um, whether or not, uh, you know, what the newsroom was like. And in particular, I asked him if there was any Aboriginal staff members at all at this publication, and there was zero. Um, of the 30 new hires that they made, uh, 15 were women, so that was pretty good. They felt quite proud of that, actually, I think it was 16. Uh, in terms of ethnic diversity of those 30 new hires, four. So uh, 
we're looking at a, a big problem in newsrooms in terms of representation, in terms of people who can tell stories, you know, from the inside, who have a sensibility about what the response would be to an article like this. Um, and uh, just one further comment about the uh, article as well. <laughs> I came from the U.S. recently. I spent a, a decade of studying at MIT, first a master's and then a PhD. And um, it's ironic that I'm on this panel my first semester of teaching at UBC because, um, you know, the nickname for MIT is made in Taiwan. <laughs> oh, good. We're a university of billion Chinese. <laughs> It's not really an issue there, right? Because everybody who comes to that school knows they got in on merit. And that's one of the things that differentiates MIT from the other school down the river, right, Harvard, uh, is that we like to say nobody came in here because their parents went here. Everybody came here because they uh, rated as, you know, top students and came in to study with other top students. So. Um, you know, merit matters, and when you're at a school like UBC, where you know that the students who got in here worked pretty hard to get here, it, that's a great feeling, right? It's the same feeling I had at MIT, where you think that it really doesn't matter where people came from, because we're all here to move research forward, and we're here as part of a meritocracy. So um, these are, uh, you know, so using the U.S. as, as a straw man, using Ivy League as a straw man in the article was particularly problematic from my perspective. There are legitimate studies, there are legitimate concerns and numbers issues and all of that to, uh, to comment on and to use as a way to reflect on what's happening in Canada, but, um, uh, you know, the way that that, that got represented and, and, and put forward as an issue because it's an issue in the U.S. Uh, doesn't quite reflect the reality in the U.S. So, uh, my second set of comments are about uh, the media and ethics. Um, Stephen Ward, who was previously the head of the UBC School of Journalism, has written enormously about ethics. Um, and he uh, considers that we are in kind of, uh, he uses like the Thomas Kuhn uh, idea of, of revolution and sort of the, you know, the freeze, refreeze, the whole paradigm shift that occurs when, uh, you know, people change their way of thinking. And so he considers that we're in the fifth revolution of journalism ethics. And uh, part of that is because we're in the midst of enormous media change. And uh, as we have seen the rise of new media, we've seen ethics and ethical considerations shift. So I wouldn't go as far as Henry is saying that McLean's is dead, because <laughs> in media, we generally see that there's a reorientation, right? We see that there's a, 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 a repositioning of media that happens as opposed to a death. So yes, McLean's is uh, suffering from you know, the same kind of business model and, and uh, and uh, uh, other issues that uh, are pervasive throughout, especially print publications. But uh, how they will be uh, repositioned, what kind of audience they will serve, is still up in the air. And that's essentially what ethics is about in journalism, is this relationship between the journalists and audience is in flux right now. If you type in two Asian plus UBC or two Asian plus complaints in Google, what do you get? You get McLean's at the top, and then you get this raft of commentary, blogs, responses, other, you know, uh, everything from, you know, the Toronto Star, and, uh, uh, Margaret Wente, and Manel Matani, and people really engaging with the article. And, you know, so <laughs> it's, a, it's a very different reality than assuming that uh, McLean's has a lot of power by publishing this. In fact, um, they've been met with an, an enormous amount of resistance, right? So. Uh, ethics are, are changing, and uh, if you look at, uh, again, going back to Stephen Ward's work, his uh, point is that uh, journalism is not just about uh, highlighting tensions or pointing out tensions, but it's in fact about disentangling the conflict uh, of values. And so uh, how does journalism go about that in this sort of new, changing, reorienting media landscape? Uh, that's an open question. And, you know, if you look at the, the responses from people like Manel Matani, who was, had an op-ed in the Globe shortly after the McLean's article was published, uh, you know, she, she brings it together by saying, okay, the immigrant story is, is not being told in Canada, and that's because of the diversity in, lack of, in, in the newsrooms. There's, that's because there's people who don't kind of know how to tell that story and know how to reach out to this you know, changing audience in Canada. And so uh, as we go forward uh, in terms of media change and in terms of thinking about ethical obligations, 
uh, you know, it's, it's a brave new world, but it's also figuring out how to uh, tell global stories uh, to a global public, to, uh, you know, a diverse public, to uh, a public that's uh, rapidly gaining the ability to hold uh, publications like McLean to account. Um, well, obviously there's no mistake here. I'm about as white Caucasian as you can get. Um, and I first read the article on my friend's Facebook feed and kind of read through it and couldn't believe what I was reading and then kind of went, okay, I don't agree with any of that, so I must not be racist. I must be okay. And the responses that kind of came out of it um, were to me, you know, like you said, we use humor a lot. Um, a friend directed me to a site yesterday called TwoAsian.ca. Um, which is focused entirely on the article. And the, the mandate is actually telling those ignorant white folk what it really means to be Asian. Really, really sticking it to me. Um, I guess I'm, I'm part of that white folk, although I've grown up in Vancouver my whole life. Um, my high school was predominantly Filipino. I was actually a minority. And so I've never felt this too Asian kind of thing that we have going on. And um, it took a lot for me to kind of go through the article and, and to think about what it really meant to me besides the fact that it was clarifying I wasn't racist. Um, I think that one of the, the most important things that came out of it for me was, like we are sitting here today talking about having an open and honest dialogue about race and what exactly that means on this campus. Um, we have an incredibly diverse campus. And it's, it's strange because I mentioned that I grew up in Vancouver and I never really acknowledged the fact that there was a, a huge majority of, of Asian uh, descendants in Vancouver until I came to university. And I think that's because um, at UBC, you know, in contrast to when you're at high school, you, you have a lot of diversity, but you don't have people coming from other countries to your country for school. So that means language barriers and different cultural contexts and different customs. And to me, that was a big change, was getting to engage in, in those different um, environments with these people. And I think that I, I've learned a lot from it, and it's enriched my education. And I think that one of the most dangerous things that this article can do is to diminish our capacity to actually discuss and analyze um, some of the issues that the claims raise. Um, I think that there's not a lot of ground for some of the issues that they've pointed to, mainly the whole they work too hard and shouldn't be here argument. Um, I worked really hard to get here, as I'm sure everyone else did. Um, and I think that our applications process speaks to that. But what really concerns me is having this dialogue and sitting here today and then leaving and not really asking the more difficult questions. Difficult questions like why you know, students, whether or not they were in context or not, chose to respond to the interviewer the way that they did. There must be actual um, beliefs or perceptions of student life on campus that lent themselves to these views. So what are the issues that we're not dealing with, not only as a campus community, but as an administration? And it's great to see the new administration here to address um, some of these issues. Like, for instance, do we really have a language barrier on our campus? And is that preventing us from engaging with our fellow students? Because if it is, that's not, to me, a form of self-segregation, like the, the article claimed it to be. I think that's a failure on our part to, to bring new students in and to allow them to engage in the campus life that they were hoping to get out of this experience. Um, and as we mentioned earlier, the National Survey of Student Engagement, the NESI data, has said that commuter students and students with fami uh, family obligations and burdens are less likely to get involved on campus life and outside of academics. So surely that must include some students of Asian descent as well. And instead of arguing about self-segregation, maybe there are things that we can do to actually engage those students as a community and as an institution as well. So I think one of uh, my main points as a student is looking at this a little more honestly and asking the more difficult questions. Because I think one of the things that we've become really great at in Canada is building up tolerance to other cultures and to other um, races. And I think that that's something that we need to actually break down today. If we're going to break down the barriers of race and of involvement, of engagement on campus, then we need to look at how we're going to build acceptance instead of this tolerance that's become sort of the, the standard within Canada. Um, I think that one thing Canadians have been really good at is ignoring the fact that we have different races in Canada. Um, I remember talking to someone in student development who had a lot of experience in the States, and race is very open and discussed there, and it's very acknowledged. And in Canada, we act like we don't have it, like there's no differences. Um, well, obviously there is, and clearly some of us are struggling to, to live alongside those differences. And so I think this discussion... Um, needs to be an honest one and most importantly needs to engage with the people who think otherwise 
who might hold some of these racist sentiments or sentiments that, you know, we've laughed at today because what the hell else are you going to do but laugh when you're not offended? Um, if we're going to build a community that's focused on acceptance and not tolerance, then everyone needs to be included, and those people need to be included as well. So that's something that needs to be discussed today, too. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished speakers, thank you for this opportunity to speak on behalf of my students uh, and, and on an article that I believe has misrepresented our university with its poor content and message. The very story of how I heard this article exemplifies a number of methodological mistakes and omissions I believe it has made. Two weeks ago today, an Indo-Canadian friend of mine posted an article on my Facebook wall suggesting that McLean's had written about my people. Sure enough, a picture of two students pulling a Chinese flag pops up on the screen. It was deeply ironic that a pan-Asian, a member of an ethnic group that the article conveniently forgets to mention, was telling me that I was too Asian. There are a number of questions that arise from this article's quote-unquote research. Why not mention that Persians, Filipinos, and Indians are all technically Asians, and make up a significant part of UBC's student population? Why even mention Korean and Japanese students statistically, if their perspectives are not being presented in the piece? Why not question Ukrainian Canadians, Italian Canadians, or Jewish Canadians about their individual and familiar pressures to succeed? The truth is that such a process would have created so many diverse perspectives that the article's socially constructed dichotomy of Asians as one socially inept group and whites as one socially interacting group would cease to exist. Furthermore, this article makes the erroneous assumption that certain UBC culture clubs represent the spectrum of race relations and cultural interaction on our campus. <laughs> A simple glance at the membership list of these clubs will tell you that the Japanese Association has many Chinese members, the CBC has many Caucasian members, and the mainland Chinese love to join the Taiwanese Association. This article incorrectly assumes that individuals join cultural clubs to reaffirm their specific Asian identity, rather than to serve the very social and self-actualizing purposes the article describes us as lacking. The writers would have done well to interview our recreation athletic team, students in a migration studies course, or members of a club like the International Relations Students Association, which would have provided a much broader and accurate perspective. Personally, if I was interviewed for this article, I would have told you a completely different story at UBC. I'm a member of a fraternity, where nearly half our members are Chinese, Indian, or Persian. I was the president of the Merging Leaders of UBC, where our executive was made up of an Indian, a Cambodian, a Hong Kongese, and a Filipino. And yes, we were legitimately doing volunteer work in the downtown east side. <laughs> I studied in our, a program where Chinese, Japanese, and Korean students often major in political science and English. And French Canadian and European Canadian students often study Asian languages, just so they can be more Asian. In other words, my perspective would have probably ruined their entire story. <laughs> If there is one good thing that has come out of this article, is, it is that it has sparked anger, frustration, and united students from all ethnic backgrounds to see beyond these overly simplified constructs of mainstream Asian and white. Students have expressed a firm belief to me that there is no longer a white Canada, and there won't be an Asian Canada. That by creating such a false dichotomy, we are forgetting the very value of multiculturalism and cultural understanding that made Canada so desirable in the first place. This article is also, in my opinion, a direct attack on one community, the Chinese community. The clues to this attack are all too obvious. The Chinese flag in the picture, the discussion of Chinese Jews, and the fact that the article talks about two Asian, but all the students interviewed are of Chinese heritage. McLean's article is reinforcing the belief that Chinese immigrants, especially recent immigrants, have become a threat to the sanctity of the Canadian identity. As such, this article has managed to clump the Chinese community, a community as diverse and old as Canada itself, into a single ethnic group, perceived to have reaped disproportionate educational benefits while avoiding full Canadian assimilation. Canadian assimilation, as curiously defined by this article, is identified as partying, <laughs> drinking, <laughs> speaking English, and not studying. <laughs> Fear and resentment towards China and Chinese is not a new concept raised by this article. In Vancouver, a city known for its strong education system, the impact of the anger towards Chinese has not only been felt on a university level, but also on an elementary school level as well. Currently, we're engaged in a major debate over the creation of a Mandarin bilingual program, 
simply because many parents deem newer immigrant children a threat to the academic success of their own English-speaking children. Outside of the educational realm, the increasing wealth of the Chinese business investment in Canada has correlated in the higher real estate prices viewed as threatening in many traditionally non-Chinese neighborhoods. We're simply put a country that fears the increasing dominance of China. But the reality matter is, in the next few generations, new Chinese immigrants are going to play a bigger role. Canada has just been named an official Chinese tourist destination. Taiwan is looking to improve youth exchange with uh, Canada through MOUs. More Chinese will be in our classroom, bringing with them valuable resources and culture that we can either choose to share collectively to strengthen our Canadian identity or utilize to create further tensions. I want to end on one last note, and this is one I'm speaking directly to my fellow UC students. Oftentimes, we, ourselves, as Chinese, Indians, Filipinos, and Persians, are the biggest perpetrators of the two-Asian stereotype. A couple years back, one of the clubs on campus created an ad campaign based on the fact that their club was not a two-Asian club. As we can see from this article, these types of hypocritical activities must come to an end if we are, as they only perpetuate the negative stereotypes about our campus. Until we begin to embrace our own identities and differences, we cannot expect any different from others who may not know the difference between someone from Taipei, Beijing, or in my case, Victoria, D.C. <laughs> and instead, they might see us as a sea of black hair and brown eyes. I know this because I myself have, at various points in my life, rejected my own Chinese heritage. I specifically avoided making Chinese friends. I refused to learn the language. I even avoided studying sciences and engineering. Why? Because they were too Asian. <laughs> However, when I stepped out of my boundaries, met a Mandarin-speaking girlfriend, began studying migration history with Dr. Yu, went to China to see my parents' hometown in Shanghai, and Taiwan to do research, I began to embrace who I was. Canadian and Chinese. Oh, you're back, eh? <laughs> That to the two authors of this article that they do the same and gain some cross-cultural experience. Um, we can let McLean's Magazine talk all they want about how we are too Asian, but we cannot allow them to spread this fear-mongering, needless self-classification, and prejudicial othering to our student body. Let us show them with our actions, our character, and our strong, diverse community that we can integrate, we can interact, and we can produce real cultural change for a dynamic Canada. Thank you. Um, Margaret Wente got mentioned a couple of times. Um, let, me, let me offer one short paragraph and see if anybody would like to uh, respond, because it comes back to some of the university issue. Several of you use the word meritocracy. Quote, the growing Asian presence on North American campuses is a big story, culturally, demographically, politically. It's also a story that pits some of our most cherished values against each other. We believe that our public universities should broadly reflect society. We also believe they should be meritocratic. But what if those two values collide? Just a thought. Do they? Who wants to throw their hand? Carrie? Awesome. I'll, I'll try. Okay. <laughs> As I said at the opening, if I felt that the university wasn't a safe place and a fair place, we'd be in a lot of trouble. And I think that we are a fair and a safe place. And so whoever gets in, gets in because of a whole host of things. And it's not just, you know, a tick mark and all that kind of stuff. And I wrote a little note to myself just reflecting on some of the comments. And, and I felt that, um, you know that the university has it right you know that any university has it right, no matter what anybody says, is when you're free to be, don't have to live up to your stereotype. Right? I think that's really important. I was the same way. I went to Simon Fraser. Every Chinese kid in those days, in the 60s, 70s, or 80s, they went to UBC. No one went to psychology. They all went to medicine and law. I was supposed to be a dentist, apparently. <laughs> but uh, uh, they said, because know why? Because I used chopsticks. Eh? My fingers were strong. That's what they told us. <laughs> but... You see, you know, I, I think I think where this 
That's what they told us. I, I kid you not. <laughs> but when it comes to admissions and whether it's the electoral process or the admissions, you know, we have a system in our, uh, that we use, right? And of course, there's, it can always be improved. Like when three Chinese guys got elected to, to uh, Vancouver City Hall before we topped the polls, right? They said, oh, so you guys got all the Chinese votes, right? You know, and that's what they all said. And they all accused us of that, you know. I don't know if that's true. You know, I go down Chatham, people still boo me. So, you know. <laughs> but, here, but still, when we come to the university, I think, you know, in my career here, I've been here since 91 as a professor, I've seen students, no matter who they are, or what they are, what color they are, they all come with a fantastic set of skills. So something must be right. When we admit to our medical school, there's a lot of Chinese kids, a lot of kids from all over the place. Sometimes there's more Chinese kids, sometimes there's fewer. But I, at the end of the day, I felt that our admissions at this university must be doing a good job because no one, you know, it's not, there's no special interest. They were all good students and they were all doing well. And so if we haven't got that right, then we know it, I think, pretty quick, certainly from a faculty level, that's for sure. Thanks, Greg. Anyone else? Yeah, uh, let, me, let me actually take this uh, from the perspective of the U.S. since it was invoked in the article about model minority and all this. And uh, I taught at U uh, UCLA for 12 years. And I was there during the time when um, a number of state propositions we're trying to outlaw affirmative action. And the, the strange thing about that article was how it misrepresented the debate about meritocracy at public universities like the University of California, which is the crown jewel of the U.S. public university system um, and you know, considers itself it, but everybody considered it that. Uh, so I'll, I'll make a couple points about meritocracy. One is Margaret Wente's, I don't know which country she lived in, but universities in the 1960s, if you came in here, there were very few women, and very few non-whites. They were not meritocratic places in the sense of let's represent society. They were meritocratic in terms of judging what were the useful skills that we needed for whatever and it tended to, in fact, overwhelmingly reinforce who was already in UBC. That's changed. We don't have that anymore. If she says we've always been meritocratic, she's just wrong historically. Does that make sense? One of the things in the United States is meritocracy generally is a mixed bag because it's generally used to protect in certain universities who's already there because they deserve to be there. So when Harvard says we're meritocratic, you know, we only accept the best. The best and the brightest include those whose daddies came here. 25% right? of most Ivies is legacy. Someone whose parents or grandparents went there. They're the best and the brightest. It's a kind of elaborate money laundering scheme where you take, <laughs> it is, I mean, we call it this, right? We called it that in the U.S. So you take half your class as valedictorians, top of their class, high school, and then you mix them in with legacies like George W. Bush, right? <laughs> they all came up with the same degree. And that's why that mix was so crucial to create a meritocratic, they're the future leaders. Does that make sense? One of the other things that happened in the whole Ivy League debate that was mentioned in the article, but they didn't go was that it was very difficult to figure out that the Ivies were capping Asian Americans at 15%. Because they don't tell you why they accept. Princeton doesn't say, here's our criteria. If you're chosen to be a Princeton student, we don't tell you why. You just get anointed. And so I happened to be a graduate student there. I found out from the coach of the lightweight football team. Now, lightweight football teams, there's a real football team that gets killed by everybody, and then there's a lightweight football team for people who are 160, I think, or 150 pounds and less. They have a whole football team for small, lightweight people. Asian guys. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it was Asian guys or not, but they were small guys, okay? Because small guys need a football team for themselves at Princeton. The coach of the lightweight football team had 15 set-asides which meant that he could go into the admissions office and pull any 15 students applying who were lightweight and good football players. So the United States is a very different environment for what meritocracy means. We've created in Canada a certain definition of meritocracy. I'll throw one thing out where I do think we should be questioning. Does that meritocratic system, yes, it's great for hardworking, studious people. I think that's good. But how does it address people who don't have the resources. So do we have an underrepresentation of First Nations and Aboriginal peoples? Yes. And in that sense, meritocratic practices, in fact, are counterproductive. Uh, and with one very quick example, it's called the course reader example. If you had a class 
and you started the class, and it was, uh, let's call it alphabet, we have 50 students and 25 course readers, and we hand them out through the alphabet. Hand them out A, B, C, D, and then you run out somewhere around L. Right? And then you're doing assignments and tests, and about halfway th through the course, or maybe earlier, the people whose names are Wong and Young and stuff, they start to complain and say, we're getting killed on these tests because we don't have a course reader. Right? You, you, you're testing us, and, and we're, okay, so the teacher says, all right, it's halfway through the semester, we're going to switch to a meritocratic system. And whereas from now on, okay, I'm going to rank you all according to the grades you did, got in the first half of the class, and then hand out the 25 course readers again. <laughs> We're meritocratic. We've switched to a meritocratic rather than an alphabetized system. It's alphabet blind. Does that make sense? <laughs> so we have a fair system, but the first half was not fair. And what it does is it reinforces inequities historically. That's why I'm a historian. That's why I want to make a historical argument about meritocracy. If you have an unfair system, making it fair is good, but you can't just discount what happened in the first half of the semester. What are the solutions? Well, one of this, you can say, there's a model minority. Those Wongs, they went to the library because there was one course reader on reserve, and they got a track of the dawn to get that course reader. Or they got together and bought one from one of the you know, kids whose name was Bell, and they were drinking all the time and didn't care about the class, right? <laughs> oh, they made a knockoff. Uh, they, they made a knockoff. They went to Taiwan and printed it. So, so I, I throw this out just as, again, let's not valorize meritocracy as just an, as a pure good. There are problems, too. I'm sure other panelists want to say something. I'd also like to get to others in the room. Are you guys okay with us doing it okay? ECAT's going to take it from here, but we're open to questions. So we're going to open the floor to questions. Um, so when your name is or when I do choose you to ask questions, um, just stand up, uh, tell us your name, and uh, if you have a specific question directed to a specific panel member, um, you can do that as well. So we'll start with the person in black right there. Uh, my name is Rob. Um, I was I was a little bit not taken off, I guess, off guard by the tone the panel took with regards to the article. This may come off as a little bit unenlightened, so just to frame, I'm from small town Alberta. Um, I, I didn't meet someone who wasn't white until I came here. Um, and the idea that McLean's is diminishing was surprising to me because it's where we go for our national news. Um, and when I walked away from the article, I didn't walk away going, oh, those dirty rotten Asians are taking all our spots, we need to kick them out. I walked away going, yes, this is a, this is a, this is a division that I see. How do, we, how do we bridge that? And I also am coming from, uh, I just finished my last of five consecutive contracts with student housing, and um, our job, the tone I always took with my staff was, community happens, whether we are there or not, but it's up to us to form that community. Uh, and I saw the same cliques form at the beginning of every year, and my staff would work to break those cliques apart every year, and we were usually very successful. One of the ones that we consistently struggled the most with um, were not Asian cliques per se, but Asian immigrant cliques. Uh, and at one point, I was talking to one of my staff members who's Korean, and a girl came up to her, said something to Korean and, in Korean, and walked off, and I asked her what she said, and she said, oh, why are you talking to a foreigner? I was kind of like, well, I don't, I'm not a foreigner. So I just like, I guess, <laughs> I guess what I'm getting at is the tone of the panel seemed very, this article has no basis, let's laugh it off. But for people coming from my admittedly probably very unenlightened lens, it had a very strong basis. So I'm wondering what your thoughts in that regard. Um, so I, I don't think that this panel was laughing it off necessarily. I feel like this panel was actually engaging pretty seriously with it in a humorous way because it is so discomforting. And so I refer back to my comments about framing. And I think there's no doubt that we need to discuss diversity. There's no doubt that we need to discuss um, systemic inequities that create the kind of system that we have right now. Um, you know, there are many ways to get at this issue of, you know, the present being intolerable on, on many levels, right? Um, and so uh, Henry talked about, 
you know, Aboriginal people, you know, not being represented here because of, you know, systemic inequalities, right? So, that, you know, that's one whole aspect uh, that we can discuss, the, the way that the meritocracy doesn't uh, always uh, reward equally. Those are legitimate issues, and, I, and, I, and diversity is, is part of that issue. So I think the panel is actually engaging with it. The, the issue that I think most people have here is, is the way that the question got framed. So too Asian doesn't ask the question in the right way. Let's talk about diversity on campus. Let's talk about, uh, you know, Wenty, for all the faults of her article, she is trying to uphold this... Uh, you know, journalism sort of ethical obligation to, or journalistic ethical obligation to, to say how do we, um, you know, elevate the public discussion to, to actually have kind of a extended, informed discourse about uh, whether or not uh, meritocracy is the right way to approach. Uh, you know, diversity issues, whether or not uh, there are other questions that need to come out about diversity. So, um, yeah, I, I think that the biggest problem that people are identifying is the, the opening question. Let's say if it had started with the guy, instead of starting with Alexandra and Rachel, what if it had started with the guy who said, um, you know, someone came up to me at high school graduation and said, you know, you took my place at UBC, uh, you know, and, and you know, too bad, I worked really hard to have that place at UBC, right, and to conform to all of the standards that UBC expects. Uh, so what if we had started with that anecdote as opposed to, you know, two party girls? It would have been a very different article, right? It would have, it would have set a completely different tone and, and set a completely different framing question to understand all of the evidence, the actually pretty good evidence that they marshal in the article. So. I stand up, it's like City Hall, you have to stand up all the time. <laughs> Um, you know, it, it's very interesting to thought that, you know, and, and, um, and, and part of it, you know, this is some of it's generational. Like, I'm, I'm older than you, way different generation. And uh, certainly when I read it, why, well, you know, the tone of, uh, it was kind of scary because, gee, for all of our lives we fought to kind of get the rights to do something and is this going to bring us back? And that's, it, it was seen by a lot of folks in my age group as, as sort of an attack on something. So a lot of folks here, you know, we, we argue, say, oh, you guys are enjoying the benefits of all the old pioneers, the low lock, you know, that came here in the first place, put up with all this stuff. The veterans remind me of this every Remembrance Day, the Chinese veterans. Every single time, we fought and got you the vote, you're lucky. Um, you know, you don't have to do that. And, and I think the other thing, too, is, is this change in tone. It's sort of like in our day, you know, I sound like an old guy. Um, they used to say, you're lucky to be at university. You're lucky you got in. You're lucky. No, it's not. I worked hard. It's my right to be able to apply. And so when the, when the article says, oh, is it too Asian? We've got to cut back the Chinese a little bit or the Asians. It's back to those days. And so that's why. And, you know, if you grew up in Vancouver as long as I have and, and you know, having your head beat in and all that kind of stuff called racer, I'd call worse. In fact, I still get called worse when I open my mailbox at City Hall. There's a lot of race stuff out there. Um, and if you don't laugh, you're never going to get through it. It's that simple. Have a question? Uh, maybe the question in the back with the grace letter. Um, I like what the panel is doing. I think the question that's addressed of how the question was framed is an important one. I don't mean to put it aside. But I do like what our friend from Alberta said, that I think many of us came to this panel, came to this forum, not to question UBC's integrity, but you came to ask, what is UBC planning to do as to how to address diversity? And what is, like, one of my suggestions would be, like, in classroom to have randomized groupings. Because it, is, it does take an extra effort for you to go to the other side, <laughs> to reach out to people who are different from you. I think having a randomized grouping will help us with that. Yeah. Um, I have to say, both with uh, our friend from Alberta, Rob, I think, yeah, and, and Jack, um, I think that what I had mentioned, that there are problems that this article is stemming from. One of them is is the barrier that we have in our classrooms of not reaching outside of our groups, whether that be an Asian group or a group from your high school or what have you, or you see it in housing. And I think that what we're saying as a panel is not none of these problems exist, but it, it's that they do exist, just not on the generalized scale, first of all. So that was kind of in response to Rob, not on the generalized white versus Asian scale. But I think that what Jack was saying, um, you know, one of the problems that I've had in my classrooms is 
is third and fourth year not being able to speak um, in English in a classroom to someone of many different descents from different um, backgrounds. And I think that problem starts in first year when you're in a classroom that is like hundreds of people big and you don't ever have to talk to somebody if you don't want to. And that continues smaller class sizes as they go down the chain. And I think that randomized groupings and forcing students to get out of their comfort zone, whatever that may be, is a, a huge thing that should be talked about within the institution to get people out of those different cliques that we talked about forming. Whether or not those are racially formed or otherwise, I think that you know, if we're going to be focused on building a community, that conversation in our classrooms has to be where that begins. Uh, this, uh, I, I think maybe the generalized answer to that, again, is uh, and in mocking McLean's for its shrinking demographics, I didn't mean that small-town Canada was disappearing, just that McLean's business model was not going to work in the long run. Um, but one of the things about on-campus, I hear all kinds of conversations on campus. Now, let's just get one thing straight. You're not in here unless you speak English at a high level. You're not getting in. Sorry. In fact, we can talk about that. Should there be, you know, a, you know other aspects of this university where people... Uh, no. Right now, you don't hit the TOEFL score, you're not here. So when you hear someone speaking a non-English language, it's because when you look at our survey figures, more than half of our students can speak more than one language or had a home language that wasn't English. Does that make sense? So if there's a group of people who may be speaking a language, it may not be their first language but they can speak English. Just because you hear a group of people speaking something, it doesn't mean they don't speak English. Does that, does that make sense? I, speak English. I, 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 think I think this is so crucial because it's shifting away from an ideal of Anglo dominance where the best thing in the world is to only speak English. Now, Carrie was mocking that. I was mocking that too. Right? That's not an ideal that's useful if you graduate from here. Right? When you go out in the world, it's good to be able to speak Mandarin to someone who wants to sell you something or buy something from you who speaks Mandarin first. Does that make sense? <laughs> it's good to have multiple languages. It's good for our university to reward multiple languages. So what we've got to be careful on is that English is the only language that people can interact here in. That's actually a bad model. Right? If we say everybody's got to speak English to each other, what we've got to shift is say, it's good to speak multiple languages. Let's start from kindergarten. Let's go K through 16. So that by the time you get here, like in Switzerland, like in many countries around the world, like in most of Asia, you have to speak multiple languages. It's a good thing. It really is. I swear. I wish that I could speak five languages. But you start when the kid's young, and then you reinforce it all the way up. And when you get here, you try. Now, we're trying to build something from, from material that's difficult. People come from all over the world, and so we need to create. And, you know, we have committees that talk about this, and we hope that your voice on this is strong. How do we create a better intercultural a set of dialogues across not just cultural differences, but all kinds of differences? That's what a university is for. And so I'll, I'll throw that in a very impassioned, be really mindful when you look around and see conversations going on. Just because they all got black hair and they're speaking something doesn't mean there's a lot of... There isn't a lot of differences between those people that they're working out in their conversation. They're more comfortable in that language working out. Or maybe they're working on that language because so, they don't want to lose it. Okay? okay so really quickly, um, we can do a ton of things structurally, but it really does start with us individually. I mean, even in this room, we see people from all over the world. Let's start today and meet someone that you traditionally might not consider someone you'd want to be. I think it's something that I've done personally. Um, my friend Devinder is in the room. He's He's been my end to the, to the Indian culture. Um, I, I start, initially, my, my parents told me Indians were those people who, you know, build houses and try to screw you over. And <laughs> that's what I was told. <laughs> And, 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 and my, my parents were like, we'd never ever hire an Indian. Like, don't talk to those people. They're all gangsters. You know, look at them shooting each other up in the news every day. And I, and I thought to myself, well, this can't be true. Look at this guy. I mean, he's so nice. So I went out of my, out of my way to meet him. And through him, I have expanded myself into the, into the Indo-Canadian network. I Regularly, we go to the Sikh temple to pray um, and do these type of things. And these are the type of cross-cultural experiences that individually we have to take to step out of our normalized boundaries. Um, and then... That way we can also bridge a lot of uh, gaps, in my opinion. Thank you. Let's have a question from over here. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to preface, this is just my own view. 
Um, I'm, I'm a bit surprised by, by the tone of the panel, uh, especially after I first read the article. Um, and the, the way I first read it was that it was presenting these views that people have that are essentially racist. And that there is this anxiety towards Asian people um, and a fear that's common. And I think if, if no one's encountered that, you're not listening. It is the most casual sort of racism in Vancouver. It exists. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and, you know, you hear it every day. You really do. Yeah. So I was really happy that this article was written because it was talking about race in a way in which Canadians... It was a Canadian discussion. We don't ever have that. We don't talk about race. We're tepid and nervous and uncomfortable with the subject, unlike, you know, Americans, I think you, you mentioned earlier. So I... Um, I, I was just wondering, I mean, do you think it was it, it would have been better if this article never had been written? Or if or if, if it's good that it's out there? Like, I, I agree that it was framed badly, I really do. Um, and I, I, I know the author personally as well, and I, I, she was trying hard, and I think there might have been a problem with the editor as well, because McLean's is yeah. sensational. Yeah. Um, but yeah, do you, do you think that it would have been better if this had never been out there? <laughs> yeah, all right. Yeah, all right. Okay, I'll be real quick. So, no, I'm glad the article was written because I had the very same reaction. I said at the beginning, I didn't quite know how to take it. One minute I said, ah, oh, I'm pissed off. Next minute, hey, this maybe it's talk about something. But again, it was sort of like the Russian. I'll, I'll fight for anybody's right to talk about something, but it's how you do it and the data you present makes all the difference in the world. That's going to be say whether or not it's a good discussion or a bad discussion. And in terms of, it was a Canadian discussion? No, because I think Canadians know better. Canadians do better research than that. And, you know, whatever the reasons how, you know, why it was kind of sloppy, that's a whole other issue. But I don't think it was a really something. Canadians are good, careful folk. We're well known for that. And to have that kind of sloppy journalism is wrong, but to have the question asked was the right thing to do. And, uh, you know, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Wow, I get the last word. Thanks for asking the question. And I think um, you're, you're, you're right about something. Uh, it's trying to get at a sentiment, at an anxiety that's out there. The problem is, is that when you set it up as two Asian versus anonymous young women who aren't even... A you know, brave enough to use their name, it, it, it sets a kind of tone for the discussion that doesn't move it forward. So yes, does, does a discussion about anxiety, about anxiety about admissions, about, uh, you know, integration, about multiculturalism, does that need to happen in Canada? Absolutely right. Absolutely, it does. I mean, you're right about that, and I think that Canada would benefit from the kind of uh, conversations about race that Barack Obama has brought to the fore in the U.S., right? Uh, but um, by sit setting it up so that uh, a Asians are a kind of monolith, right? By setting it up so that uh, they're, they're, you know, that monolithic group, which doesn't really exist, I mean, everybody's kind of alluded to that uh, on the panel, uh, that that monolith can't, you know, is on the defensive immediately. It doesn't uh, move the, the conversation that needs to happen forward. It doesn't produce the kind of responsible discussion that uh, possibly, you know, McLean's could have started, right? And I think that, that that's the problem with the article. Does it need to be discussed? Yes. Does it need to be, uh, do the questions need to be asked in a way that uh, promotes a responsible discourse about it? For sure. A safe discourse. I mean, this is what Carrie keeps referring to as well. So. One uh, hint, the word intercultural was used. I just wanted to let all of you know, because of your interest, the university has announced that um, uh, a member of uh, our community recently directed diversity um, at the CBC, Alden Habakon, will be joining UBC on December 1st. Anyone who's interested in some of the focus groups that Alden and others will be putting together to explore the notion of intercultural competence and how we take advantage of the university community to work on some of the things you're hinting at, email me, and I'll take that as permission to pass your name on to him, that's all, brian.sullivan at ubc.ca, if you'd like at some point to be a part of the focus groups we'll be organizing over the next couple of months on that. Check out also our own local peer-reviewed journalist and publication, the UBC. For some, some very interesting back and forth on this topic. Please, I have the formal thank yous here, but I will uh, just ask you one last time to join me and thank you, our panelists.